distinguished guests, dear friends, I would like to give you my very warm welcome to the opening ceremony of the 22nd edition of the SAFE, or SAFE, postgraduate program in uh, energy resources management, and to the workshop on uh, motorsport, innovation, technology, and sustainable mobility. Welcome to a very special, but also a very different opening ceremony. Thank you to all of you for joining us uh, from around the world, for accepting our invitation to share with uh, our SAFE postgraduate uh, participant this important moment for their personal and professional development. Even though many things uh, may have changed in the last uh, months, there is uh, one thing that has remained the same. It is uh, a great pleasure to be with you all today. It has been uh, too long since uh, we have seen each other, and I know you will agree that uh, it would be nice <coughs> for us to meet uh, in person. I know that uh, many of you are now quite familiar with uh, virtual meetings. We have uh, adapted, we have uh, continued to deliver the best we could for our stakeholders, for our partners, and of course, for our master SAFE participant. It has not been uh, easy, but uh, it has certainly been done with our maximum commitment, uh, passion, and energy. So, please uh, allow me to thank uh, all of you and to thank my SAFE team uh, for their hard and good work. And talking about the SAFE team, I have the pleasure today to have uh, with me Andrea Moretti, which is uh, a colleague uh, of mine at SAFE, which will uh, facilitate uh, the panel discussion and support us during the event. How are you doing, Andrea? Yeah. I'm feeling good. Thanks a lot, Raffaele. It's really a pleasure and a big opportunity for me to be here and participate to this <coughs> event and, and our panel discussion that will be really amazing. We, we choose really, really great contributions from around the world. Thanks, Raffaele. So if you want, uh, uh, I can start just talking uh, Please. a little bit uh, about uh, our organization, yeah, about SAFE. <coughs> Uh, as you know, SAFE is an independent organization. We recognize credibility and professional experience in the energy environment sector, operating since more than 20 years uh, with its interactive network with over 200 companies and institutions. Well, um, in line with its mission, SAFE organizes also the postgraduate program in uh, energy resources management. And today, it's the day, the day of this program and with the, the purpose of educating the next generation of sustainability leaders. So this multidisciplinary postgraduate program provides participants with significant opportunities to share knowledge and experiences with key representatives of institutions, enterprises, and academia. So our uh, lessons are not real lessons. They are really witnesses, I can say. And today it is the open ceremony of the 22nd edition of the postgraduate program. And well, we will focus our panel discussion, all, all the event on safe racing, safe racing, uh, about innovation, technology, and sustainable mobility all together just in one event. So together with key personalities for international sport federations, institutions, and also enterprises. So, investor and, and business guides in this sector uh, will discuss about how motorsports has the power to catalyze sustainable mobility development, enhancing technologi technological innovation and engaging communities into this new revolution. Well, um, I would like to, to give some um, details, a brief um, overview on, on the program we'll have <coughs> later on. So uh, after a, a brief introduction that uh, I will give you the, the floor, Raffaele, uh, to, to introduce the panel, uh, we will have some very, very special guests to our uh, panel. Um, just I would like to start to, to give the, the, the name of, of our distinguished speakers. So Mr. Alejandro Agag, so the founder and chairman of Formula E and now 
of extreme E that we will, leave, we will have later a really interesting uh, contribution to, to see what's up, what happened in the, in the desert and will happen uh, around the world in really extreme terrains. And Mr. later Mr. Rodi Basso, co-founder and CEO of E1 UIM series. So uh, yeah, maybe the, the most interesting uh, competition in the marine sector that is coming. And it's really full electric with a special design. And Rodi Basso later will, will tell us. So of course, Mr. Raffaele Chiulli, uh, so founder and president of as we said, but also uh, president of the Global Association of International Sport Federations. So we are talking about, I, I, so t tell me if I, I'm wrong, more than um, thousands of uh, national sport federation, thousands of sport clubs, and millions of athletes that uh, yeah, participate in competition under the, the big umbrella of guys. And then from the world of enterprises, Mr. Francesco Venturini, CEO of uh, NLX. So, well, we can say the energy enabler of the, uh, the, the motorsport and also um, yeah, the company of the um, NL Group that is really specialized in energy efficiency and uh, whatever is about digital solutions. But Mr. Venturini later will tell us uh, better how NLX is, um, is really key for the enterprises world. And well, after this moment of the, the panel, we'll have, um, yeah, just amazing contributions. So I, I, I'm really, yeah, I, I feel um, uh, a moment of emotion when I, when I say those names because we, are, uh, we, we lost uh, Formula One world champion, not one, but more than one. <laughs> so Mr. Jenson Button, uh, Lucas Di Grassi, Formula E world champion, so maybe the best champion uh, in the electric um, formula uh, that we will have in, in Rome in a few days. And uh, uh, Miss Sophie Orn, so when we are going to talk about the E1 series, we will have yeah, the designer of a really uh, amazing um, electric boat. And uh, at the end, but it's not the end for sure, uh, Mr. Nico Rosberg, so Formula One world champion, but also sustainability entrepreneur. And we will hear something inter interesting from him. And um, well, of course, later on, we uh, will have our past graduate program participants and all the projects that we are going to carry on uh, during this year with our partners. And just to conclude the, the event, we'll have Mr. Stefano Besseghini, the president of the Regulatory Authority for Energy Networks and Environment, that will make the final remarks, uh, Raffaele. So I, I think it's the moment to give you the floor to, to open this uh, amazing event. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. It is your first uh, experience uh, moderating such uh, a, a high level panel. So congratulations. I think you've, you are doing uh, a, a very good job. Thank you, Rafael. Um, I'll do my best for <laughs> sure, as always. <laughs> so uh, allow me to say, dear friends, uh, we can uh, uh, all be proud uh, of the way our community has reacted and uh, adapted and also uh, we should be proud, uh, you mentioned the world of sport and the 128 international sport federation under the umbrella of uh, guys. So we have continued to deliver on our promises and uh, we have continued to walk the talk. Uh, there is certainly uh, much to tell you about the way we have continued to deliver uh, since uh, we last uh, met uh, uh, Deviso. Uh, it has been uh, a year of uh, remarkable achievement uh, especially since uh, many of them have been in the face of remarkable challenges. And we have to say this because uh, it has not been uh, easy. So sport has remained a beacon of hope and so much more throughout the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic uh, has also required more than hope. We have needed practical solutions that change people's lives for the better. And we have delivered this. If you remember when uh, the first wave uh, hit uh, and the first lockdowns became our new reality, sport was there to make our daily life healthier and allow me to say more tolerable. 
with our sporting heroes, and we had many sporting heroes right next to us, giving their guidance, giving their encouragement. Uh, we kept active uh, even in our, home, uh, uh, in our own uh, homes, uh, in our houses. We shared with them inspirational moments that we could uh, never forget. Sport showed once again how it can bring communities together and uh, help us focus on the beauty of the team effort, on the lessons of winning and losing with grace and allow me to say with fair play. Lesson that I believe are more important now than ever. And we are now actively working on making sure that sport will be a leading actor in the post-COVID-19 recovery. Just think about uh, this summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. Think about uh, all motorsport competition already started, such as the Formula One, the Formula E, the MotoGP, the Extreme E. But as uh, you know, sustainability is a topic uh, close to my heart. It represents uh, much of my life's work, both outside of sport and within sport. And I truly believe that we are all stewards of our planet's future. And that's why today we would like to focus on sustainability and today we would like to specifically focus on sustainable mobility. And in this context, motorsport is playing and will play more and more a key role and shortly we will see several successful examples of this. Sustainable mobility is a milestone of the EU decarbonization roadmap uh, as uh, outlined in the European uh, Green Deal. Uh, we have seen that the expected result should be 90% cut uh, by the uh, 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 carbon dioxide emission by 2050. And this uh, has to be delivered uh, in uh, a smart, competitive, safe, accessible and affordable transport system. So transport indeed is one of the most uh, uh, greenhouse gases emission impacting sector together with the energy production. We all know that it contributes for more than half of total carbon dioxide emission, these two uh, sectors. And the substantial reduction of the emission in the transport sector implies further development of uh, alternative fuels, but also improvement in uh, transport efficiency. We need a considerable increase in the use of electricity, which, as we all know, requires significant infrastructure investment and the development of uh, low carbon and storage new technologies. So, in a nutshell, sustainable mobility will be key in what uh, I would imagine our greener and smarter cities, along with uh, circular economy. Zero waste, zero emission buildings. So think about uh, the buildings of our uh, uh, near future and all digital application. Our behaviors, our mindset, as citizens have to rapidly change and to adapt as we are more demanding, as we are more proactive, as we are more interconnected. One of the key enablers to raise awareness on sustainable mobility is education. At all levels, from school to postgraduates, and every single day, we at SAFE are committed uh, through our Energy for Talents education program, including the Master SAFE, to achieve such a goal, fostering knowledge, competence, and innovative solution. But allow me to say that sport can certainly help in raising awareness and be a laboratory for testing new technologies and solution. And many are the example that could be mentioned in this area. Certainly, 
the Formula E with uh, both the institution, the FIA, and the promoter, Alejandro Agag, led the way. But also there are other international motorsport federations that have been very active, uh, such as the International Motorcycling Federation, the FIM, with, uh, for example, the ENL uh, Moto E World Cup, which is the first championship dedicated to 100% electric uh, propulsion bikes but also the UIM, which I have the honor to be the president of, uh, with the newly uh, launched E1 series, the first uh, world electric uh, powerboat uh, series. So I would like to conclude this uh, uh, part by saying that uh, we all must not underestimate the power of sport. Sport is enjoyed and loved by millions of people. So its potential to have a positive impact on our world is uh, unparalleled. Sport has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope and often is more powerful than governments in breaking down barriers, and we've seen uh, this example nowadays. We promote the values of Olympism, which is simply a life philosophy that combines sport, education, and culture. And it's exactly in this spirit that we have organized today's workshop. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rafael. It's so inspiring, and yeah, we're just starting to, to make the the great match from sport to energy and education. So the last words you said, really inspirational and well, maybe it's the moment to, to start the, the round table. We have a yeah, uh, great context and we will have really uh, big, big um, contribution from our guests. So um, just, just to start, I would like to, to give uh, the, the word to Mr. Alejandro Agag, just start from him. We, we mentioned already all the, the participants to our round table, but I would like to, to start from him because, if, yeah, uh, when we talk about motorsport and we talk about uh, energy and, and business, so he is the, the, the right uh, man to ask. So, um, Mr. Agag, hello, good morning, and thanks to be here. Uh, I would like to tell you, well, why conceiving this topic for our event, our minds, of course, went to Saudi Arabia and the first ever competition of electric SUV in an extreme terrain, in a, in a desert. So extreme E is now reality and for sure it will be the future. Um, so three World F1 champions have their racing team in, uh, in this competition. So Hamilton, Rosberg and Button. Uh, and the, the last one uh, is also a, a, a pilot of this um, electric SUV. So, we will have a special contribution later, so uh, just, just to see what we are talking about when we say Extreme E. So people who is following us today, especially our, our postgraduate students, represents the growing interest in environment preservation, the battle against climate change, and the will to act for sustainability in a concrete way. So we are very curious to hear your vision and your experience, Mr. Agag. Well, hello everyone, and um, Thank you very much for the, this invitation to participate on the Master SAFE. Thank you to President Rafael Iculi uh, for his support over all these months. We've been working together very closely to develop a really, really important project for us, which is the UIM E1 Championship that is going to showcase for the first time electric power boats around the world. And uh, within all these projects, that's why we are uh, here. We are here first to give you, the students, a message of encouragement, a positive message, because um, environment and sustainability are going to be at the center, are going to be the direction in which everything that is going to happen in the next decades is going to turn around. We have to put climate action, we have to put environment action at the center of all our ideas of all the businesses that we are going to be creating, of all the initiatives, because the big challenge of our time is 
to keep our planet safe, to keep our planet as a viable uh, ecosystem for human life to continue. And this today is uh, under threat. That's why I want to encourage you, all of you, all the students of this master, to push, to go ahead, to keep learning, to keep creating, and to keep this direction of climate action, of environmental uh, action. Like, you know, President Culey, the OIM, us, we are pursuing with, uh, with all our projects. In a time when the world is, uh, you know, very, very diversified, you have many ways of uh, seeing information and to, to consume information from the digital to, you know, uh, social media, to many, many channels that bombard you with information all the time. People tend to look at uh, kind of icons or reference to guide themselves. And these big personalities have become that. So people follow personalities like Lewis Hamilton, like, like I said again, Leonardo DiCaprio, Greta Thunberg, and so on and so on. So to have personalities like this supporting initiatives like ours, like Formula E with the case of Leonardo DiCaprio, like Lewis Hamilton, the case of uh, Extreme E, we will see who comes and supports uh, E1. Uh, it's key to catch the attention of the general public, especially of the new generation. And the new generation is the one that is going to have to make the real change here. Because still, for me, I'm 50 now. Of course, I'm working on these projects. I love working on sustainability, but I'm not going to you know, be a victim probably myself. You guys, the new generation, you're going to have to face big problems connected to climate change. So is the new generation really the one that has to take responsibility for this? And, you know, these ambassadors really help galvanize, help bring together big amounts of people into those objectives. Thanks a lot, Alejandro, for this uh, opening of our round table. Well, we, we feel the responsibility and of course, we, we just started to talk about the special relationship between energy, sustainability and motorsport. Uh, now, I, I would like to, to, to thank uh, Mr. Francesco Venturini and Mr. Rodi Basso that in li are live connected with us. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to, have you, to have you here. And of course, we, we will have a, a, um, a great conversation also with uh, Raffaele. And yeah, uh, just to go Farther in our roundtable, um, I would like to, to start from uh, an example, so a global example of um, how a, a company can uh, have a, a, a big role in, uh, in paving the way in, in terms of technological advances and in terms of uh, immobility spread to the mass market. So I would like to, to ask to Francesco Venturini uh, just uh, yeah, your experience with uh, your company that um, since its birth started to, to invest on um, motorsport. So we, we can say from cars, motorcycles, tourist car and, and so on. So, well, we are very curious to, to start from your perspective. My perspective is that uh, uh, motorsport is essential uh, if you want to um, uh, have a, a good path um, into research and development. Uh, it was extremely important for us to uh, be uh, among the first supporters uh, of Formula E uh, almost, uh, what, seven years ago at this point. Um, and uh, the, the reason why we decided to uh, uh, support motorsport uh, was because we uh, saw um, the possibility of working uh, with uh, people looking for uh, extreme research uh, uh, and uh, uh, all, the, all, all this extreme, you find it uh, in, um, in, in competition. Um, the, those chargers uh, uh, that were designed to uh, support uh, these super ultra uh, fast cars, uh, then are the ones that helped us uh, in building uh, the uh, uh, chargers that you find in the streets. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously in, in the past several years, uh, we've been keep developing uh, uh, different kind of chargers. Uh, and I think that uh, the, what you find now, for example, in MotoE uh, is uh, an expression of what the future is gonna look like when you combine a charger that is obviously is connected to the grid with uh, a um, energy storage, a battery 
then it's supposed to provide more power and more capacity um, for the uh, vehicle uh, that is charging in that moment. Um, all these kind of products uh, that right now are uh, on the racing circuits, uh, you know, in two or three years, uh, will be on the streets uh, or in our garage. And uh, obviously the purpose uh, is to have uh, a, a technology advancement, uh, a, a progress that supports uh, these extreme vehicles, uh, because then at the end, all this technology is the one that is gonna support uh, our uh, wives, our kids, uh, our parents, our friends uh, uh, that are gonna drive uh, electric vehicles because uh, there is no doubt that 100% uh, uh, of mobility 10 years from now uh, is likely to be uh, electric. Thanks, Francesco. For sure, the, the relationship between um, racing circuits and the daily life, it's, it's going to be every year more present and more clear to everybody. Um, well, we, we will go back to the circu racing circuits later on. Uh, I would like just to, to talk a, a bit about sustainability uh, from a wider angle. So, as we mentioned at the beginning of the, of the event, uh, sport in general has a, a key role in promoting sustainability and also responsibility to, to people. Uh, and today, Raffaele, uh, it's really a bigger opportunity so to go um, and yeah, to have your, your point of view as president of GAIS, the, the Global Association of International Sport Federations. Um, yeah, can you tell us something more about this relationship between sustainability and sport in general? Certainly. <coughs> well, as you said, uh, <laughs> I have the, the privilege, but also the responsibility of uh, uh, managing an organization that encompasses 128 uh, international sport federation, Olympic or uh, non Olympic, so it's, uh, it's a fairly uh, large family. But allow me to say that uh, innovation, technology, and sustainability are really at the heart of uh, what we are doing at uh, GAIS. And certainly through our actions, uh, we continue to demonstrate to the society uh, that sustainability truly plays a central role and that uh, we are all united as International Sport Federation uh, in our efforts for a positive change. So just to mention uh, a few examples uh, and, um, and uh, just to uh, emphasize how sustainability is really at the heart of uh, what we are doing, uh, uh, I'm very proud that we have created and also we have assigned our first uh, uh, Guy Sustainability Award. And uh, I'm also very pleased uh, uh, of our sustainability portal, where we already have thousands of uh, uh, documents of interesting uh, scientific paper, etc. And, uh, and this has been created with uh, the full support of the International uh, Olympic uh, uh, Committee. So, uh, I just mentioned a few examples, but allow me to say that uh, at GAIS we do encourage uh, all our member sport federation to make uh, environmental, social, but also economic sustainability as a core priority of everything they, they do. And through our initiatives, we are not only be able to encourage action, but uh, also shine a spotlight on sport's significant contribution in uh, promoting uh, uh, awareness for sustainability. There is very much need to raise awareness. So that's a clear example. And I think Extreme is a, is a very good example of that. Uh, so we at GAIS are now working with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, uh, within the Sport uh, for Climate Action Framework, uh, which unites sport organization in taking the responsibility for their climate uh, uh, footprint. So several uh, of our international sport federation have been able to come up uh, with innovative ways to promote uh, uh, sustainability and uh, ensure that all their events, so we are not just talking about uh, competition, but events in general, uh, they are more sustainable. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, for example, one of the 128 guys for International Sport Federation, the UIM, uh, in Monaco, we launched this uh, uh, first ever 
let's say, uh, uh, extreme uh, uh, new uh, UIME one World Electric uh, 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 series. And uh, uh, Rodi Basso, which is with us today, played a very key, a key role. And uh, both uh, uh, me and Rodi, but also Alejandro, we are convinced that uh, uh, this uh, electric sea racing will accelerate with catalyze sustainable mobility at a global level and uh, foster the preservation of our marine uh, environment. So allow me to conclude just by saying that on a personal level, I've seen both individuals but also corporation uh, embracing uh, uh, sustainability. And I've seen that they achieve uh, even more ambitious result. Uh, uh, and often you do more with less. So the respect for the environment, uh, society and the community uh, um, that come when you embrace sustainability are uh, very much in line, are very much uh, compatible with our values uh, uh, of sport. So I believe that it's very much important to take uh, a leadership uh, role uh, uh, within uh, uh, our uh, uh, sport organization when it comes to sustainability. So, there are actions that can be taken to, for example, very specific area. Think about uh, plastics. So take plastic pollution, uh, for example. So every year, about 8 million metric tons of plastics uh, enter our oceans. And plastic production also significantly contributes to climate change. So with a concerted effort and the right planning, International Sport Federation can begin to minimize, I'm just saying to minimize the amount of plastic that is used at all uh, uh, their events. So sport is a passion shared by a truly global community and international travel is a large part of uh, these events. And um, certainly we have to ensure that uh, uh, all our sport organization reduce uh, their climate footprint also in regard of travel. So I conclude uh, by mentioning uh, the great efforts, allow me to say, from the cluster of all motorsport uh, federations. So uh, the FIA, the FIM, the UIM, the, F, uh, the FAI, uh, uh, the aviation, uh, <coughs> uh, so car, motorbike, aviation, powerboating, to support and foster the preservation of our uh, environment. Uh, 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 establishing, uh, but also implementing, allow me to underline, implementing good practices uh, by testing, by adopting innovative technologies. And I think today we have great example, Formula E, Moto E, uh, UIM, E1, Extreme E, etc. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Raffaele. Yeah, we had the opportunity to to see uh, the vision and some examples. And when we talk about so many federations, it's yeah, uh, impossible to, to avoid to, um, to quote many initiatives. Also, uh, because sustainability is a priority of your organization. Um, well, as we, as we mentioned, sustainability is, is at the heart of, of sport and will be more important than ever in a post-COVID-19 environment. Um, well. Uh, now I, I would like to, to talk to Mr. Rodi Basso. Just uh, I would like to um, talk about yeah your experience in the esports industry that is really wide and in touch with uh, many different ecosystems with a common fil rouge that is innovation. So another word in, in the title of our of our event. So in general, how sport and motorsport in your vision can spread important and concrete messages to people enterprises and also government allow around the world to tackle the climate change while fully entertaining them because uh, well it's really a, a big part of, of the game the entertainment around the motorsports events hi hi everyone and thank you for the invitation in this event to inspire the participant of the safa master and uh, thank you for also for this question which is a key question that has characterized my professional experience. Uh, innovation is really at the base of motorsport. Motorsport is still an incredible um, platform for marketing, for delivering messages. 
and also to uh, test technologies and new solutions. Then, of course, it is key, the cooperation between the promoter and the federation to address the innovation and the efforts uh, of uh, the stakeholders involved in the competition towards something that can be reusable into the commercial world or, if I may say, in, uh, in everyone's, uh, everyone's lives. What I really would like to pass as a message is that the key ingredients are not only about the tools and the specific solution or technologies, but it's the approach. Motorsports and motor racing in general, because in this way we embrace all the sports that uh, try to emphasize the human machine interaction. Okay. And I was saying motor racing uh, is characterized by three very important ingredients. And these are not important in absolute value, not only, but they are specifically important in these days and in these decades that we are living. The first ingredient is the discontinuity, embracing the discontinuity. Uh, change, the rules change continuously and the engineers, technicians, all the people involved embrace these changes and they try to get the best out of whatever is available in order to win the competition. The second ingredient is the sense of urgency. You always have the race in a certain day. You cannot get any derogation. The third element is the acceleration. One of the most important book about motorsport, uh, the definition of a motor racing vehicle or vessel is that is a vehicle that is always accelerating. So, I mean, these three ingredients for me are the best uh, uh, inspiration for vision, for mission and for the execution, because this is what we are living today. And this is what we need to all uh, uh, embrace in order to drive the change uh, in the next 10 years. Well, uh, thanks, Rodi. Uh, I really love the, the point about embrace discontinuity is really, yeah, I think, the, the right approach to, yeah, to, to win those challenges, the challenges of our times. So in this, um, this analysis, I can say, I would like to, to involve uh, Alejandro uh, just also in this case because of a really big experience and also multiple roles over time. So as European Parliament member and also and for sure a successful entrepreneur in motorsport. So how we can win those challenges in your opinion? And when you talk about sustainability, uh, there is, of course, in my view, a two-phase approach. We have two clear groups of people working on sustainability. We have what I call on one side the, um, the activists, the people who raise the alarm, the people who pass the message. These people are very important. These are people like, for example, just thinking people that we have worked together with, Leonardo DiCaprio or Lewis Hamilton people that I haven't ever met, like Greta Thunberg, people I disagree with, like uh, Extinction Rebellion. But all these people uh, do something important, which is they raise the alert. They create the right uh, uh, you know, mindset on the general public. They make the general public understand that there is a big problem. And sometimes they can do it because they have important positions themselves. They're big champions in sports, they're big actors in, in, uh, in, in the cinema industry, and so on and so forth. But alert is not enough. Here is where the second group comes in, the group that delivers action, the group that effectively executes the real change. And this is the business people. This is the people from the industry. This is the people that have the means, that have the power. This is also the politicians that have the power to exert, to create real change. And this is where we come on board. This is where you know, we follow the people who raise the alert. These people make possible for us to succeed. These people make possible for us to create companies that can thrive in this environment of concern, environment of worry about the climate, about the planet. Nobody would, would care about electric cars if people first would have not explained that 
we should go away from combustion because combustion is one of the main elements of global warming. But now that people are worried, electric cars are booming. That's why our uh, initiatives, like a championship on electric cars like Formula E, now it's really also a one, will succeed because it's the right moment and people now know that is the right moment. So let me go uh, a little bit more in detail on this. The second group is a group that it's more pragmatic. And I always say the same. If you want to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. If you, and I give an example, it's impossible to do anything without emitting some CO2. We will have to emit some CO2 to get rid of the CO2. For example, solar panels. Everybody is very happy with solar panels. Everybody says we should have more solar energy. But to produce a solar panels, you have to emit a lot of CO2. The solar panels are paying their CO2 bill, their CO2 price, for the first five years of their life. The good thing is that a solar panel can work for 25 years. So after the first five years, it's carbon negative if you like. But you have to emit some CO2 to create a solar panel. You will have to use a lot of oil and you will have to emit a lot of CO2 to get out of the oil and to get out of the CO2. And this is something that sometimes the first group doesn't accept so well, but the second group, we work with reality. We work with real companies, real uh, you know, people. Uh, we have to compromise sometimes to get to the final objective. Great. Well, with this approach with two groups, it's really yeah, easy to understand how we, we have to move to, to battle for sustainability. And um, well, um, now, yeah, I can say enterprises are part of the second group for sure. And we have here uh, Francesco Venturini. And well, I, I would like to ask you, uh, could you tell us something more about the NLX strategy that is for sure an enterprise that it's in this second group and something more about also the business model and something really particular in your also yeah, value added partnerships because you work with many uh, industries uh, at the same time with many initiatives to shape a new immobility uh, ecosystem and I uh, will uh, avoid to talk about the eggs so this is not the, the moment. <laughs> Um, so I think that the, the, the best way of um, uh, explaining what uh, NLX does is explaining uh, um, the, the mission, the general mission that we're following every day. Um, what we're trying to do is um, um, to help our customers um, in, uh, in uh, becoming more sustainable, which partially, I would say mostly, um, is uh, trying to help them in reducing the, the CO2 footprint uh, in their energy consumption. Um, and at the, uh, on, at the same time, uh, what we are trying to do is uh, um, helping them in saving money in the energy that they buy. So this obviously uh, needs to be balanced. On one side, uh, you need to be more sustainable on the other side, uh, uh, you need to save money. And um, very often when we are thinking about sustainability, we think that uh, uh, is expensive. In reality, it's not. The more sustainable you are, uh, the more in the medium term, you will see that you're gonna get uh, uh, economic benefits uh, to your profit and loss uh, if you're a company. How do we do this? I mean, we do this essentially um, in two ways. Uh, one is we help them in electrifying their consumption as much as we can. So moving from internal combustion engines or other ways of generating electricity, uh, power in general, uh, into being connected to the grid. And obviously the energy that they need to buy when uh, they are connected to the grid uh, is renewable energy, green energy. Otherwise it wouldn't make uh, uh, a lot of sense. And the other thing that we do is we help them in digitalizing uh, their consumption. So it's, it's a mix between uh, uh, electrification and digitalization. This is, uh, this is our objective. Um, this is mission number one. Mission number two is to leverage on the fact that the NL is such a big utility 
uh, I want to give you a number uh, in, in a short while. Uh, that we have so much assets uh, that we can we can we can utilize to generate value for our uh, stakeholders. Uh, a, a number that gives you the idea of uh, the size of this group. Um, NL manages something around 75 million uh, meters uh, around the world, uh, which if you do some simple math, it means that uh, uh, NL is providing energy, uh, electricity uh, mostly, uh, to almost half a billion people every day. So you can imagine the size of this group uh, around the world and the kind of leverage that has to really change how things are done. That's why there is so much attention in sustainability. But again, the big belief of NLX is the fact that sustainability needs to be affordable and affordable by all. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense if sustainability was just for, like uh, Alejandro was saying, you know, for, for uh, Hollywood actors uh, or rich billionaires. Uh, sustainability needs to be for everyone. And when we're looking at uh, um, sport racing in this case, uh, we think that it is a very strong wave of uh, passing the message over to a very uh, broad population. If, if we can make sports sustainable, then everything that we do is going to be possibly sustainable too. Uh, and that's that's really what uh, what we how we build uh, um, our uh, our business model. Thanks, Francesco. We, well, we we touched really um, many uh, many aspects of the, the spread of not not only immobility. So we are talking about uh, electrification, but also other sustainable approaches that can change. Yeah, the, the, the main features are also different industrial sectors and at the same time, yeah, the daily life. So just to, to use uh, an electric car uh, in, in cities uh, as something really uh, normal. So you are working on it and yeah, it's really interesting. Um, well, um, I would like to, to, to pass a little bit to an, another specific sector um, because we, we have many, many contributions today. We are really lucky to have this conversation. Uh, so I'm talking about the marine sector. And Raffaele, as UIM president, uh, well, you, you have set uh, sustainability as a priority. And we, we mentioned many times already uh, the, the last key moment when was launched the, uh, in the Principality of Monaco the UIM uh, E1 series, but well, more in general, and also, yeah, we are interested also in the conversation with the, the Prince uh, Albert, uh, if possible, to, to know the relationship between UIM, sustainability, uh, and innovation. What's going on? Well, <coughs> uh, in a few months, uh, we, uh, uh, the, as UIM, we will be uh, one century old. We will have 100 years, we will celebrate uh, which was founded in 1922, the UIM. But in spite of that, and uh, in spite of being the world governing body for uh, all uh, uh, power boating activities uh, recognized by the International Olympic uh, Committee, uh, and um, as you said earlier, we are also a proud and active member of uh, guys, Faris, of the, the, the broad, the, the larger sport family. We are all uh, enthusiastically committed uh, uh, to make a, really a significant change. And, um, and uh, uh, we would like really to foster the preservation of the marine environment uh, and to think about a more sustainable uh, uh, future. Uh, when we launch uh, this uh, uh, new first ever electric power boat uh, 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 world series, uh, in partnership, as I said, with uh, Extreme E. Extreme E has, uh, has uh, uh, a great mission, which is the one to raise awareness, to travel the globe and to go exactly where uh, uh, the challenge of climate change exists, whether, are, uh, you know, whether it's uh, related to desertification or deforestation or snow and ice melting, etc. So this is uh, a fascinating project. We are institutional partner of that uh, project. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, 
our initiative, this uh, E1 series, uh, uh, it starts from the combination of achievement of two leading motorsport industry, the automobile industry and the marine industry. So we are convinced that uh, this initiative will accelerate the technology roadmap towards the uh, electrification of the marine industry. And, um, and we are not just addressing this issue to the fans of our sport, you know, to the, the supporter of uh, uh, powerboat racing, but to, the, to all the people around the globe that consider sustainability as a key element in their, in their daily lives. So we care about the water, we care about the environment, and uh, uh, our contribution uh, uh, is centered around raising the awareness on how vital it is to preserve and to further explore the seas, the oceans, but also the inland uh, waterways. So we want to lead by examples and we want to take action to preserve uh, a healthy marine environment uh, and to promote sustainable mobility, uh, which are vital for the future of our uh, ecosystem. So what uh, I've heard before, which is not just to have a vision, not just to uh, uh, have a mission, but to have uh, the possibility to execute uh, both the vision and the mission, I think is uh, pivotal. So we at the UIM, we are doing exactly this. And we want to enter into a new era, creating a competitive, fascinating, challenging, and allow me to say an environmentally friendly and entertaining all electric powerboat uh, series. So we want to lead the transition towards electric mobility and uh, environmentally friendly marine propulsion and uh, steer into a cleaner and more sustainable future. Uh, ideally, we would like to strive for emission-free marine mobility. So <clears throat> we would like to continue our international cooperation as today is, uh, is a good example. So develop research programs, scientific uh, uh, developments. We are working with several universities around the globe, with several research uh, uh, centers, uh, because I do believe that sharing knowledge and best practices, also with other international motorsport federations, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so I knock at the door of the FIA when we have to talk about uh, helmets, about uh, seats, about, uh, about uh, uh, seat belts, uh, uh, or at the FIM, because they are pioneering several uh, environmental, uh, uh, environmentally uh, related uh, challenges. So we need to learn from each other and uh, we don't need to be shy. We need to ask uh, for, uh, to access best and good practices. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, and we are looking at our teenagers, for example, our Formula Future program, to breed the future for sportsmanship uh, and safety, uh, at the same time nurturing passion and respect for waters and its uh, environment. So that's what we are doing with our new generation of uh, racers, uh, uh, contributing to the implementation of the 17 sustainable goals uh, of the United uh, uh, Nations. Uh, I could mention also other programs like the UIM Prop Stars, uh, uh, we are creating a, a training and coaching center worldwide. The last one I have founded in Lebanon, where we have 18 different uh, ethnical religious groups all together, all together, sharing the easy. passion for, uh, which not is not easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy at all. I can tell you, it's just outside the city of uh, of Beirut. But I was very very happy with the prime minister to uh, uh, um, actually. Uh, implement that vision through sport uh, to aggregate uh, in a virtuous way different culture, different religion, different beliefs and different genders. So this is what we are doing and I'm very proud about that and I hope to continue on that uh, pathway. Well, we have really a lot of things to, to see in the future of the UIM 
and we started from the marine sector, the, this part of our round table, and I, I can imagine, Rodi, you know, <laughs> it's your time because we would like to, to have some, yeah, mm, elements more on the E1 UIM series. We, we, we mentioned many times and we would like to, to hear from you as CEO of, of this new series which are the innovative technologies and how this power boating competition can and will also accelerate the technology transfer to different industries around the world, not only the, the, the marine sector, but just more in a, a, a wider view. Um, sure. So I would like to say that personally, I'm very passionate about the combination of sport and technology. Uh, the second point that uh, I need to, uh, I would like to share as a baseline for the for the, for the for what I'm going to say is that sustainability, of course, always recalls uh, nature and uh, emissions and all these sort of things. But there is a financial sustainability to be taken into account, which is part of the equation, and it will be more and more. So in my vision, and I have to say in my technical vision, but not only. As a sport in general, we try to be the meeting point of three sports, sailing, motonautic and uh, motorsport or high end of automotive. And uh, this technical vision is uh, uh, guiding us uh, in all the possible aspects. There is an element, again, of uh, uh, finding the common commonalities in uh, the different visions of the sport and passions, that why people are following those sports. There is also an element of technology innovation. We are inheriting from sailing the foil. We are inheriting from motorsport and automotive high end, all the electrification part, which is a, um, actual technology that is that has already recently uh, been used in, in mid-range motorsport and will be transferred in the marine industry. This is, in, this is innovation for me as well. And then there is also the business model innovation, which is also part of the equation. And we will take from all the different sports the lesson learned. So if I want to focus on the technology innovation uh, in particular, uh, there are also many lessons learned that we have learned from the automotive. And one of these that I would like to recall is our legacy po uh, program. And uh, in particular, one point of the legacy pro program. When we will go around in the different ports, we will uh, install the chargers uh, systems in order to, uh, of course, charge the power boat and make the championship happen. And we will offer the city to keep the chargers, the number of chargers they will want, uh, in order to, uh, you know, um, uh, challenge the paradigm that we have learned from, uh, from the automotive, that the electrification was not possible because of the lack of infrastructure. So the more we will go around, the more races we will have, the more we will see people noticing that there is the charger and there is the possibility to either uh, buy a tender, a, a leisure boat, power boat, uh, and, be, and the more we go, the bigger they will be, uh, and, and actually use an electric, uh, an electric propulsion. So uh, the effort that every one of us will have to do today more than ever is really about uh, the technology roadmap and the technology strategy because the technology stack is made of so many layers and uh, the complexity is so high that you need to be really like a surgeon and really study all the layers and understand what to buy or inherit from other sectors okay that's the osmosis that has to happen and that we are trying to implement in different fronts in e1 uh, series and what instead to develop and keep developing internally in order to make a difference and contribute to the sustainability process just to finish uh, we will start with a um, standard power boat so all the teams will have the same power boat and i look forward to spending time with the cto's and ceos of the technology manufacturers uh, marine industry, but also automotive, because today's this osmosis is so strong, and I believe it will be stronger and stronger than an electrification powertrain will be used in different uh, application and different mobility styles. 
And I want to talk with the, these people to understand where they're focusing their attention for the future roadmaps and then open within the standard power board that part of, uh, of uh, the vessel for further development and so to in order to drive the competition the technology competition in specific areas they will benefit the commercial use so that's the plan great great Rodi um, well I know also that we have a special contribution you you, you mentioned uh, roadmaps and how to develop real uh, ambitious projects so uh, I think we we can share the contribution from Ms. Sophie Orn, we mentioned before, from London, that is the CEO of Seabird Technologies, so the uh, designers of the E1 electric boat that is, is coming in the next months on our, um, our seas, our oceans. So, uh, please, I, I would like to hear uh, Sophie. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophie Horn. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this beautiful opening ceremony at SAFE um, and to talk about Seabird and showcase what we are working on to combat and respond to climate change. Well, we can talk about the hydrofoils uh, first and the complexity about hydrofoils. Um, it's not a new innovation. It's been here and around for over a hundred years. Uh, but if you look at current boats and the design, it's not very sexy. You have two sections um, and it looks, you have uh, traditional boat designs, but with sticks looking and coming down of the boat. So I think the tricky part apart uh, for the technology and the performance of the, of the, uh, the, the foils is to implement that in the main hall and the overall design to make it look like an art piece. Um, what we're trying to do here is that until today you have two sections of foils we are trying to go back if you go back to the word and the name of the company seabird we're trying to um, be inspired of birds and try to make the foils as a one section foil and that is very tricky uh, so you don't have that stabilization of two parts um, in, in the front and the back so that's a new thing that you haven't seen before and then um, the tricky part of building so it's going to be an airplane but on the water uh, but there's one thing to go straight on the water uh, but here again we're talking about a race format and uh, a key word that we're using in e1 is the mickey mouse format uh, so you will have a lot of turns and swings and uh, round and about uh, and that's the tricky part, to have the boat still up and going, performing in a high speed, but to be able to take fast, quick turns. Um, so here it comes back to the fly-by-wire system and uh, the control system, but that's something I would say is the most tricky part right now. So this is something, I mean, we're all in this together. So we all have to contribute uh, what we can. And this is at the forefront of the E1 series, uh, the project. Um, so what we're trying to do here, we also have to think about the network of E1. Here we have, we can put uh, Formula E as an example. Uh, they came out and showed themselves many years ago in the beginning of electrification, going back to the bubbly design, but they made it sexy. They wanted that they drew that attention to showcase that electric cars, it's super cool. Um, and then all the implementation of that development uh, using sports and uh, Formula E, that platform to implement that technology into today's cars that we're all using. This is something that we hope to do the same with uh, E1 series and then to implement for the for another series of boats that we have called Seabirds uh, for the public and for everyone else to use. Back here, thanks a lot, Sophie, uh, for this special contribution. Thanks. We are looking forward to see Seabird on, on action uh, around the world. Um, well, now just to continue with our round table. So we have seen many e-mobility applications on circuits, oceans, deserts, and so on. 
Um, Francesco Venturini, in your opinion, to, to fully uh, develop sustainable mobility, um, how NLX promoted an overall electricity mobility strategy and how conceived this with many different industries? Uh, I can quote for sure the, uh, yeah, um, when we talk about ports and the electrification of ports is one of the, um, yeah, the, the, the strategy uh, with other industries that we, we, we are in mind, we have in mind, uh, what we can expect in the near future in terms of decarbonization of the transport sector, so all the uh, different segments of the transport sectors? Well, I mean, uh, uh, to, uh, to make things uh, a, a little bit uh, uh, easier to comprehend, uh, uh, I would probably split the um, um, uh, transportation sector in four main streams. Uh, one is obviously the one on the roads, uh, uh, the other one is uh, railways, uh, and then we have uh, uh, shipping, um, so um, naval transport, uh, and then the, the final one would be um, uh, airplanes. Uh, when we look at uh, um, railways, uh, um, it, 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 very, it varies very much country from country to country. Um, if you look at Italy, I would say that probably 95% uh, of uh, uh, railway uh, transport uh, is already electrified. Um, if you look at um, uh, other countries like uh, uh, UK, for example, or Japan, the percentage uh, instead uh, is, uh, is much lower. Uh, you're looking at 90%. So there, there is a lot of uh, uh, opportunities there uh, to uh, electrify uh, that specific sector uh, within transport. Um, when you look at uh, road transport, uh, obviously uh, we know that uh, uh, immobility is very active there. Uh, it's active um, um, on motorcycles, uh, it's active uh, on uh, uh, the cars that we drive every day uh, is, is very active uh, um, in, in transforming uh, public transportation when we're looking at uh, e-buses. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated uh, when you're looking at big trucks uh, that need to move uh, from country to country to uh, transport uh, um, goods. But I think that uh, uh, if you look at uh, um, big brands uh, uh, like Tesla, like Scania, uh, um, they're all working to electrify that, that, that niche, uh, that niche too. Um, finally, um, shipping and uh, uh, aviation. Well, shipping, uh, um, we uh, definitely think that uh, most of the ports are going to be electrified uh, uh, and uh, the so-called uh, cold ironing is going to be implemented in the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, obviously, uh, big ships uh, uh, probably will uh, to, to uh, um, uh, uh, reduce their uh, CO2 footprint. Uh, um, they will need uh, to find new ways of uh, um, pushing those big engines. Probably green hydrogen is going to be a solution at that point. But what's really important today is that uh, those uh, big engines are going to stop uh, um, uh, from, from polluting when uh, uh, they are stuck in the ports for um, uh, offloading uh, all their uh, all the loads. Um, and then uh, aviation. Uh, I think that a lot of people are thinking that uh, to electrify aviation is gonna be extremely difficult. Uh, but uh, if you look at the two big companies, Airbus uh, um, in, uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, and uh, when, when you're looking at what's happening, uh, uh, also um, in the United States, uh, you will see that there are many examples uh, of airplanes uh, that uh, are being electrified uh, uh, already. In this case, probably it's gonna be a combination like for the shipping of electrification and uh, um, uh, green, uh, green hydrogen. Um, so uh, if you look at transport in general, I think that there is gonna be uh, a, a very intense uh, movement uh, to electrify most uh, of the sector in the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. Uh, and probably is gonna be a certain component uh, of green uh, hydrogen that also is, is gonna be imperative, especially for uh, um, uh, shipping and, and aviation, as I was saying. Um, for us, uh, it's extremely important to keep uh, communicating to the world uh, that this is happening, 
Um, so when, uh, when we're looking at the, um, uh, the, the racing world, uh, we see that uh, uh, there is a big movement to electrify every single sector, cars, motorcycles, uh, but uh, scooters um, and uh, small airplanes. Uh, and as we have seen, uh, talking to, uh, uh, with Rory, um, also uh, the, the, the naval transport, the, 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 the boats are gonna be very soon um, uh, electrified. And uh, um, our mission is to support sports in general, uh, if it's electric. So you will see probably NLX uh, uh, in most of these uh, um, racing circuits, uh, providing the technologies needed uh, to move these uh, vehicles around uh, uh, the circuit uh, and possibly uh, win. Francesco, you mentioned a lot of um, yeah, a lot of points. Looking at the future, also new energy vectors. Uh, I can mention. I don't want to stop to talk about future, and uh, I, I would like to to ask to to Rodi. Um, yeah, some, something really um, yeah, direct and about mobility. Which is your, your view about the mobility, uh, also in terms of behaviors, also in terms of attitudes, and at the same time, which will be the role of new generations? Because for sure what Francesco mentioned um, and all these uh, in innovations in our daily life will be, yeah, mm, the new generation will be the protagonist. So, Rodi, if you want to, to give us uh, your overview about this. Well, thank you for uh, the question, which I have to say is one of the most difficult uh, to answer, but in the meantime, also one of the most interesting because it, uh, it has to look at uh, the mega trends that we have uh, started and trying to forecast uh, so far, but also now it has to embed the, the change that, for example, the pandemic has uh, suggested uh, into uh, our lives. I strongly believe that uh, the longer you look at it, the more the pandemic uh, uh, will be less affecting the, the next trends. But uh, as, a, as a general point, I would like to say that there will be uh, a fusion of different way of uh, moving. Uh, so people will still need uh, to move around Transport is a key sector and it will always be in people's life when you uh, see the classification of uh, the highest quality cities, they're always uh, referring uh, to transport uh, as one of the important factors to get an high quality. And, um, and so, uh, again, it will be about rewriting the way we, we move around and uh, to go from A to B, maybe we won't use only one way the car or the bicycle or or something but there will be a mix of factor maybe trying to optimize the uh, emission in a specific area that we are uh, we are uh, discussing i have to say that this will be especially in the next 10 years will be announced by some technology revolution that we are all expecting there is still at least one or maybe two generation of lithium ion that will improve massively the impact uh, in terms of efficiency. Uh, today, uh, the good news is that the battery can be recycled at 70% of, uh, of, of, of the mass. And this is already a good news. And for sure, this figure will improve. But then we are also waiting for the next generation of lithium salt fire and, uh, and the, solid, the solid state battery. And as uh, also Francesco was mentioning, the presence of hydrogen uh, through fuel cell for uh, um, bigger, for more heavy transportation mode. Um, even though, I mean, for uh, talking about aircraft, there are already some startups and very good example for small number of, uh, of people to be transported that are using uh, 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 electric uh, systems. Uh, and uh, for sure, they are leading the way in, in, in this respect. So, Again, uh, there will be a mix of trends that needs to be monitored in terms of technology, in terms of how the human being uh, uh, will live in the future, for sure. If I had to be very simplistic, uh, to be very efficient, you need to also consume less. So in theory, if you can reduce the amount of time you go to the office, there will be for sure a benefit to, uh, to all, uh, uh, all uh, 
the environment uh, and everything. And so, uh, again, to conclude, I would say there will be a mix of uh, uh, technology discovering new applications, but also a new way of living and consuming the planet that we are uh, all uh, in. Thanks a lot, Rodi. Um, well, uh, I, I think that it could be really, <clears throat> really very interesting to, to hear a round table 10 years ago, I, I can say. Just imagine before the, the first uh, E-Pri or Formula E, because it, it was the, the first one, and all, all of you participated in, in different roles to, to this new innovation. So, um, and when we talk about Formula E, we, we have to ask to Mr. Alejandro Agag, just because in few days in Rome we lost uh, the EPRI and every year is, is going to be a, a bigger event. So, and you are just coming from the amazing launch of the Extreme in Saudi Arabia, as we said before. But the question is, is there much more than the race in, in those kind of, of events, isn't it? What are we doing exactly? We are doing three things. We are doing Formula E, we are doing Extreme E, and we are doing now E1. And the three of them are working on the same area, electrification of mobility. Mobility is one of the areas that emits big, a big part of the CO2, or a re relatively big part of the CO2. If we electrify mobility, we will be reducing the CO2 emissions. But if we electrify mobility, we will be also having another effect. A lot of this mobility happens where people live. A lot of the cars are in the cities and the pollution generated by uh, combustion cars has, apart from the effect on the, on the climate change and on the CO2, huge impact on the health of the public. So by, by uh, changing mobility, by doing a cleaner mobility, we will have a big effect on the health of the public. And in the case of the marine mobility, we can have a huge effect on the health of the seas on the health of the ecosystems, the rivers, the lakes, because a lot of the pollution generated on water comes from, of course, the marine mobility and the marine activity. So electrifying marine mobility has that second objective, uh, apart from reducing CO2 emissions, to uh, avoid pollution on the water. So these three championships act as, as almost like a trident, like a team to, to, to electrify mobility. Let me stop a second on extreme E. Let me comment why we are pushing this project of extreme. We started Formula E and that was great and that was uh, helping the uh, you know uh, electrification of, of uh, cars in cities and so on and so forth. Um, but we decided to do extreme E to take these cars to the extremes to the most remote locations of the planet to showcase what's going on there. And we would have different themes. Uh, one theme is the desertification, and that's gonna be the first race we're gonna do in Saudi Arabia. Second theme, it's uh, the pollution of the oceans. We will do the race in Dakar on the beach. Third race, third theme is the melting of the ice caps. We will do the race in uh, Greenland. Fourth theme is, of course, the uh, deforestation, and we will be raising in the Amazon rainforest in a deforested area of the Amazon rainforest. Fifth topic is the melting of the mountain ice, the glaciers, and we will be raising in Patagonia. This will uh, give a platform for motorsport to showcase what's going on in different areas uh, around the world. And, you know, I think behind me, you have this video going on of that. It's okay, the video? So we think that Extreme can become a really powerful platform to showcase directly to the people what's going on, but even more, to take action in those places. Because the time of awareness, it's already passed. Now is the time for action. Now is the time to take measures. And it's very important that every one of us does action. Small actions, many of them add up to a big action. We will be planting more than 1 million mangroves in Senegal that have an incredible capacity to absorb CO2. 
we will be re uh, recovering and restoring a beach that is like a sanctuary of uh, turtles on the Red Sea. We will be doing a program with UNICEF in uh, Greenland to uh, educate the children of Greenland on sustainability topics. And uh, we will be reforesting areas of the Amazon, restoring areas of the rainforest in the Amazon. And we're now looking for a project in Patagonia. So extremely showcases what's going on, but also promotes action in those locations. But about Formula E, let me stop in Formula E for a second on the upcoming Rome, Ypres, and when we are going with Formula E. Soon we will be in Rome. We will be so lucky to be in Rome, you know, even with the current circumstances and COVID and all the problems that this has, we've been granted by the Italian government with an exception. We will be able to do the race, even probably with no spectators. When we come to Rome in a moment where Formula E, it's on a, a really, uh, a, you know, important uh, time of its, of its history, especially in the technology development. And I want to focus on this. Sport can be, also, can be an element to raise awareness about you know, electric cars, but also can be a platform to improve the technology of those electric cars, or in the case of E1, of the electric boats. Formula E started with a technology that was in a very early stage. So we needed two cars to finish the race per driver. The driver would do one half of the race on one car, then do go to the pits, stop, and do the second uh, end of the race with the other car. After three years, we were able, with the technology development of Formula E, to do the whole race with one car only. This is what we call Generation 2. We will be racing in Rome, of course, with the Generation 2 cars. But the Generation 3 is coming. And the Generation 3 will be a car that will be 100 kilograms lighter, 150 horsepower more powerful, the performance will increase spectacularly. And they will be um, you know, getting to speeds and performances that really can be very similar to, you know, I'm not going to say to Formula One yet, but to get to a level that it starts to be very close. This is what a championship focusing on one specific technology can do. And then this technology can be used on the cars, on the road cars that we use uh, in our normal lives. So I think we're going to see that in Rome. Hopefully, you know, we have the, a great support from, from the city of Rome, um, from all the administrations, from all the sponsors in Italy. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we will have an event in Rome, which I have to say, on these COVID times, not easy, but, but very much looking forward to it. Yeah, also, we, we are in Rome, so we, we are waiting for, for this big event. Also, it's unfortunately, uh, it's not possible to be present, but, well, we will be entertained, as uh, Rodi said before, also far from the, from the circuit. Thanks a lot, um, Alejandro, for your uh, overview on, the, on this two comp racing competitions. And I would like to uh, say bye and also really a, a big thanks for your presence today in this round table to uh, Mr. Francesco Venturini, CEO of NLX, and uh, Mr. Rodi Basso, CEO of E1 UIM series. Um, just before closing this moment of our uh, event, uh, I would like to, to give the floor to Raffaele for some final consideration. Well, <clears throat> we've heard about uh, sustainability, sustainable mobility. We didn't uh, uh, talk about our cities. And we've heard about Formula E, uh, which actually is happening right uh, 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 at the heart of our cities. So we need to put sustainability agenda uh, um, uh, in conjunction with what's happening in our cities. The cities we are living in, uh, in a circular economy perspective, uh, as uh, a person I respect a lot, a manager, uh, a great manager, which is Francesco Starace, the CEO of VNL, uh, recently told me, Raffaele, you need to have your postgraduate uh, uh, students uh, Focusing on uh, let's talk about it. <laughs> concrete, uh, concrete, uh, uh, circular uh, economy, and um, if we look at the current urbanization trends, we see that uh, 
uh, there is a significant pressure on uh, urban uh, resources, uh, systems, uh, infrastructures. And certainly there is uh, 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 the demand for new approaches uh, uh, in governing, uh, 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 financing, but also monitoring uh, uh, urban performances. Uh, why is all that? Simply because uh, our cities are uh, laboratories where innovative approaches uh, can be tested and the energy, food, water and climate nexus uh, can be implemented with uh, a real uh, circular economy uh, perspective. If we think that uh, by uh, 2050 uh, more than 70 percent of the world population will uh, live, uh, commute, uh, and work in uh, urban uh, um, uh, areas. Uh, between now and then, uh, cities, uh, suburbs uh, will undergo significant transformation to create uh, sustainable living conditions for their uh, residents. So, mobility from one side, but also energy, are the twin uh, uh, pillars of this uh, transformation. And both will require from all of us, uh, uh, radical adaptation to meet uh, demographic, economic growth without increasing congestion or pollution. So cities will require sustainable mobility and uh, energy solutions, which will be integrated with uh, customer-centric uh, infrastructure and uh, related uh, uh, services. Uh, so the convergence of uh, Mobility from one side and energy again is critical and uh, these are exciting times as we've heard uh, today uh, uh, where new technologies allow people to rethink the way they live, to rethink the way they work. And certainly the mobility sector will be at the forefront of the uh, transformation, let's say, of uh, uh, new patterns. Uh, developing, I'm sure, new uh, business models, uh, uh, new services, but also sharing models rather than ownership or personal use of uh, vehicles. At uh, SAFE, or SAFE, our vision and framework is uh, clear and simple. We would like to support policymakers, but also the, uh, any potential investors, uh, uh, stakeholder to undertake uh, all the actions uh, required to accelerate sustainable uh, uh, mobility where energy and urban transformation certainly will uh, converge. So thanks Raffaella, I, I really uh, agree with you. As you know when we talk about um, the, those kinds of um, arguments we, we really like to be concrete. We like to have roadmaps and do projects and arrive to results. We, we don't like to do only brainstorming. And today we had really the opportunity to, to touch many, many uh, aspects. So everybody is watching us can, can find its inspirational uh, aspect. So, well, um, thanks again. We, we, we can go further with our event because we, we are uh, yeah, ready for, for the next part. So. I'll give you the floor to, to present the, this special part, special contributions, Raffaele. Thank you so much, Andrea, and uh, thanks uh, for your uh, excellent uh, contribution to this uh, uh, workshop, to this uh, round table. And uh, now I'm pleased uh, and I'm also honored to present our special guests. We have uh, three world champions that made sport values basically their life uh, philosophy. And uh, certainly their desire, their wish for a better future, particularly for the new generation, uh, uh, led them in different, but uh, allow me to say, convergent way to promote sustainability as uh, real role models as real ambassadors of uh, sustainability. So, directly from the uh, E-PRI, uh, 
Nico Rosberg. Nico is uh, the uh, 2016 Formula One world champion. Everybody, uh, I'm sure, yeah. remembered <laughs> that uh, uh, he did uh, beat such uh, an amazing uh, personality and champion like um, Lewis Hamilton. And personally, I had the pleasure to be invited by Mr. Todd in uh, Vienna uh, uh, right at the end of the season uh, to um, uh, basically uh, uh, celebrate at the, the FIA award. gala wow. the, the awards giving. Uh, and uh, certainly Nico did uh, an amazing um, uh, performance and uh, then he decided to, uh, to step uh, 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 away from uh, uh, Formula One. So um, certainly uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's a big pleasure to welcome Nico Rosberg, uh, which has developed several successful uh, uh, initiatives uh, in uh, sustainability, particularly uh, uh, promoting several startups. But also we have uh, today with us uh, Jenson Button, again another Formula One uh, uh, world champion. He won the title in uh, uh, 2009, uh, driving for uh, Brown. And um, uh, he has just uh, uh, guided his own uh, JBXE race team uh, at the inaugural season of the uh, newly launched Extreme uh, E uh, uh, Championship. But uh, we also have uh, a friend from uh, Brazil which is Luca Di Grassi, Formula E record holder, uh, most points, most trophies, no other driver in the Formula E uh, has uh, been as successful as uh, Lucas. And he by no means uh, uh, rests on his uh, uh, laurels. So this Formula E world uh, uh, champion of the um, 2017, he is also one of the co-founders and first ambassador of the fully electric uh, racing series and belongs to what we would uh, define the protagonist of the Formula E both on and off track. Ever since I started when I was uh, six years old, I had you know, a very, very clear dream and that was to become Formula One world champion. And now I've achieved that. You know, I've put everything into it for 25 years of racing. The first thing I did when I saw the World Championship trophy was to look, where's my dad? You know, to see him, and that's been uh, amazing. He has a character. He's not sort of, he doesn't go over his limits. It was very, very, very hard. In the beginning, it was uh, just my arms that were really hurting. But at the end of the day, it was my arms, my neck, everything. <laughs> Absolutely did. I think I was very strong, I felt good in the car, I was able to push like hell, a bit like my dad in the old days. <laughs> really pleased you know, to get two points with some good overtaking maneuvers and everything, and I'm happy. Ah! Thank you so much guys, thank you very much. Well, Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful, Nico. Great job. How you know how it feels. Yeah, this is my home, you know. I've grown up here all my life, lived here, gone to school here, and so now to win uh, at home is it's very special. Losing engine power. Yep, copy, Nico. We can see it. Nico, box, box, box. Too many problems with the car. I would, I would like to go to the end. Excellent drive, Nico. Well done. Thanks, everybody. Yes, come on, guys! Come on! Yeah, awesome, guys! Yeah! Yes! World champion! Monkey! I've achieved this childhood dream now and I'm not willing to do that, that sort of commitment again for another year and I'm not interested in coming fourth or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm a fighter and I, I, I want to win. And so I've decided uh, to follow my heart and my heart has told me to stop there, call it a day 
and uh, go on to, to other things and it's been it's been wonderful and it just feels right. Ciao a tutti i studenti del Safe Master, uh, un caro saluto qua da me e da, dal paddock di, eh, di Extreme E in Saudi Arabia, uh, la nu il nuovo campionato di motorsport che anch'io ho la squadra, si chiama Rosberg X Racing e sì, stiamo lottando contro il cambiamento del clima tutti insieme qua con motorsport che il sport può avere una potenza enorme e allora vogliamo fare quello con il nostro sport e uh, spero che ci seguite tutti, un caro saluto di nuovo, vi faccio vedere un po' la macchina veloce qua la macchina del nostro garage, qua una bestia sta macchina elettrica così vi faccio vedere anche dove, dove sono qua nel deserto che un location pazzesco guardate un po' sono qua in mezzo, in mezzo a nulla qua nel deserto e la, la, il circuito è proprio in mezzo alle dune qua spettacolare ciao ciao Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a quite an important part of my career, you know, to, to reach 300 Grand Prix. I think I'm still on cloud nine at the moment. Amazing, you know, it's um, it's as much the teams as mine, you know, they've worked so hard for this. Wow, what a day, you know, it's been, it's been amazing. <laughs> wow, this feels good up here, and I get a free bottle of champagne as well. Let's go, let's go! Okay, big push now. Amazing victory in my best of my career. You know, they're all very special, but uh, this one uh, extra special. through so many different sort of eras of Formula One, so many emotions, so lots of good memories. I'm going to be competing in uh, Extreme E in uh, 2021. Uh, not just competing, but I've actually got my own team, uh, which is really exciting because it means I'm going to be going up against Lewis Hamilton's team and Nico Rosberg's team. So there are three F1 world champions that have a team in Extreme E, along with multiple world champion rally drivers, rallycross drivers, Dakar champions, off-road champions from the States. I mean, it's an insane lineup. And then there's little old me that's raced on tarmac. <laughs> Waking up in Paris is wonderful. You can visit the Eiffel Tower, take a look at the Mona Lisa, or race around Napoleon's grave. The circus is back in town. I drove Formula One, Le Mans, all over the world, the best cars. When I heard about electric racing, I was skeptical at first. No roaring engine behind me, no vibrations, just something that sounds like the future. But in the end, racing is about competing with the finest, working with the best partners, boosting new technologies to the edge. Sure, it's a show, but we're shaping mobility for tomorrow. Here in Paris is where the world agreed to fight climate change, to use green energy, to think different, and 
that's what we're doing. Making electric power more popular. I think we are pioneers, pushing the limits, being faster all around. Because time is still. But we are still racing drivers, taking risks, striving to win, be the best, the first, the fastest. Delight, the Lucas de Grassi, phenomenal race here in Paris. I'm Lucas de Grassi, and I can tell you, the champagne tastes even better when you know it's for a reason. Hello everyone, uh, Lucas de Grassi here, Audi Sport race driver in Formula E. And I'm here to say first, um, good luck to all the students of the SAFE Masters and also for the, for the professors, for everybody involved. And uh, Alejandro is a good friend of mine. Uh, we were together in the very beginning of Formula E and also in Extreme E. This weekend is the first ever race of Extreme E. And next weekend is our Rome event um, as, uh, third and fourth race of the Formula E World Championship. So um, good luck and uh, all the best and take care of yourselves, okay? Bye-bye. Thank you to all our distinguished guests uh, for their valuable, memorable contribution. Thank you so much. We now continue with the official opening of the 22nd edition of uh, the SAFE Master uh, Programme. And this year we have decided uh, to give uh, the floor uh, to our participant uh, in uh, an unconventional way. The task uh, was uh, certainly not uh, easy, but uh, I'm sure they had a lot of fun. Let's hear from them. The world of energy increasingly needs professionals with a multidisciplinary background and awareness of environmental issues. The postgraduate program in energy resources management has been organized by SAFE for over 20 years. The educational program is structured in integrated and complementary modules. Four preparatory modules to enhance organizational and behavioral skills. Plus six technical modules to provide a solid foundation in the energy and environment sector. The unique teaching method of energy resources management and the ongoing professional updating are guaranteed by the synergic involvement of multiple players. Classroom. Direct interaction with the main leaders of the energetic and environmental fields. Business case organized in teams is assigned to identify an innovative idea with the aim of presenting a new investment opportunity. Specialistic seminaries, participation in events of scientific study organized by the main companies and associations in the fields. Project works such as technical, strategic, regulatory and economic studies and initiatives. Workshops specific occasions in which all participants are active players, sharing experiences and proposing ideas and solutions. Company Day, organized days at companies and institutions location. Operating site visits. Meetings with top managers and discussing professional opportunities with headhunters and HR managers. The SAFE Master is a unique opportunity. Have deep insights into the science, economics, and policy of climate change. Interact with policymakers and corporate leaders from the energy and environmental sector. Gain a solid foundation in the energy industry, as well acquire managerial skills. Develop an understanding of policies, technologies, and financial models that support sustainable development and energy transition. To gain an in-depth knowledge and vision of energy technologies, industries and markets by also developing a strategic mindset to address major future issues within the energy and environmental industries. The energy system is undergoing a fundamental transformation and I want to play a key role. Thus, I want to develop managerial skills for the transition into the new energy world. Understand the management of energy business. To have the possibility of meeting leaders HR managers to create my whole network relevant for my professional growth. Strengthen the link between the academia and the business world by means of a structured placement service that has guaranteed a placement rate higher 
95% over the years. I have the possibility to work in different fields, planning, project management, marketing and communication, institutional and regulatory affairs. Share the knowledge with a multidisciplinary class, creating a challenging osmosis between colleagues. Business case, uh, workshop and project work uh, to have a clear understanding of the real challenges of this world. Have a wide vision of the energy market, from fossil to renewable energy, from centralized to decentralized power generation, being critical with respect to the next challenges. Environment. Innovation. Decarbonization. Green. Electric. Technology. Future. And now, my best uh, good luck uh, and good wishes goes to the 28 uh, postgraduate uh, participants. I would like to sincerely thank uh, all of them for their commitment, for their motivation, especially during such a difficult period of uncertainty associated with the pandemic. Now, I would like to mention our uh, partners uh, with whom we will work together this year with our postgraduate participant for the project works. I will start uh, with uh, Accenture, Edelweiss, Edison, Erg, Illumia, Iren, and uh, RSE. So I would like to thank uh, this uh, amazing partner for their valuable contribution to support our master and certainly to work together our master SAFE students and I'm sure for them it will be an unforgettable experience. And now we have the pleasure, we have the honor to welcome a friend of SAFE, Stefano Beseghini, which is the president of the Regulatory Authority for Energy networks and uh, environment, ARERA. Thank you so much, Stefano, for uh, your contribution to this event. It's very much appreciated. The floor is yours. So first of all, thank you, of course, for this uh, invitation. It is always a pleasure to receive. And uh, I will try to give some uh, uh, hints and some uh, uh, reflections on uh, what uh, we did today and what we expect to be the, in the near future. I've seen that uh, the topic of today is uh, somehow related to speed. And uh, this recalled to my mind uh, a point that we have always to be uh, very aware of, uh, which is uh, the fact that we are uh, uh, struggling nowadays with uh, a different need of speed. Because uh, we have, of course, uh, a reminder that uh, we are living in a transition period and we have to experience uh, an energetic transition that uh, by itself is somehow a quite uh, low speed process. Because you know that uh, in energy, at least up to now, everything was uh, relatively slow. The investment cycle was quite long and uh, the solutions period of a structure was quite long but uh, as you see I use the term worse because uh, nowadays we are experiencing that uh, things are changing and are changing very quickly and we are experiencing that uh, we have a need for speed for this transition uh, related to the objectives that we wanted to uh, pursue and the targets that we have given to us that is some uh, how in struggle with the uh, intrinsic speed of many processes that uh, characterize energy. So we have uh, this need for speed and uh, I always recall a quite famous uh, sentence from Mario Andretti that uh, it was used to say that uh, if you have everything under control probably you're not going uh, uh, fast enough. Uh, which is of course uh, true if you are talking of uh, a race car or you are driving fast uh, on a circuit. But uh, we must be aware in this energetic transition that we must uh, be sure that we move fast enough, but at the same time, we have more or less everything under control. 
Otherwise, uh, the risks that uh, we can experience uh, to sustain uh, either cost for this transition or which is probably worse to leave somebody behind because of, uh, uh, of course the society needs uh, to be able to tackle the different uh, topics of the transition with uh, the proper speed in order to accommodate uh, the differences in lifestyle and in the uh, needs for the use of uh, energy and uh, environment that we are able to, uh, to to identify and to uh, properly properly use. Uh, sometimes uh, returns the term of just transition, which is uh, another uh, important uh, point uh, of our period. And of course, this uh, uh, argument uh, becomes even more important if you think to the uh, pandemic period and the effect of the COVID that, that uh, we will experience uh, probably for some years. Uh, again, probably not uh, the uh, sanitary emergency at this uh, level of risk and at this level of uh, uh, struggle uh, uh, in the society, but for sure, the economical effects uh, will last uh, uh, for a little bit longer than the pandemic uh, and the sanitary, uh, sanitary uh, effects. So we must be uh, aware that uh, it's a, a complex uh, topic that we are facing uh, and we need uh, the contribution of everybody because uh, it's very difficult to imagine that we are able to face this transition with uh, one plan, one uh, government body, one institution uh, dealing. Uh, I think we must be very convinced, uh, deeply convinced uh, that we must uh, face uh, a multilateral approach. Uh, everybody uh, should be able to deliver uh, the, uh, its contribution at its best. And so uh, this is, from the other point of view, a, a reason of hope and a, a reason of uh, motivation to deliver, uh, to study deeply, to understand uh, the things uh, in their complexity, and to be sure that uh, in this uh, area of uh, the transition, uh, there will be a lot of space for people that is able to deliver solutions, uh, to understand the problems, uh, and to connect the points. Because uh, it is always uh, important to have people that are not only able to perform at the highest level their own speciality, but at the same time to be able to understand the other issue. That's, uh, uh, it's very uh, hopefully to have a, a, a system that is able to deliver all the information together and take the decision on an evidence-based analysis and very accurate cost-benefit. Unfortunately, we will not be able to take decision in this uh, very effective and proper way. Probably we will need to take decision with some degree of uncertainty. And uh, we are able to understand that to take this uh, decision with uh, some level of uh, some level of uncertainty, if uh, we have uh, the conviction that we are able to connect the points and to understand uh, the system as a whole. So this is my uh, wish uh, to the people attending this uh, new cycle of uh, safe uh, of safe to be able to uh, understand the complexity and the opportunities that are behind the transition scheme and uh, to squeeze out the best of this understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefano, for uh, your appreciated uh, contribution. I do share uh, your key points. Uh, uh, this uh, transition is going to be complex. Uh, and uh, we must ensure that uh, this transition has to be fair without uh, leaving uh, anybody behind. And certainly, you launch this message to SAFE or SAFE, whatever you would like to call it, but certainly our postgraduate uh, uh, students, uh, they got uh, the challenge to help all of us to ensure that this transition uh, is going to be fair and is going to lead us towards a better 
environment, a better planet. Thank you so much, Stefano. Thank you, Rafael, and everybody. Bye bye. Dear friends, I know that uh, when we will meet again, uh, we will be reminded uh, of uh, just uh, how special it is to see each other in person. We have also seen uh, the work uh, of uh, both sport and energy does not stop because of the pandemic. If anything that works has to become even more important. For their part in helping to make sure our work has not stopped, I would like to thank uh, once more all our distinguished guests and uh, all of those who have helped us to move forward. Our challenge now is clear. First, we must overcome what uh, we know will be a very difficult period. And uh, then we must be ready as science helps to bring us more solutions. And beyond the, the biggest stages, we must be ready to help sport and clean energy assume its proper place in our everyday life. Just uh, as the situation with uh, the pandemic is uh, always changing, our common solution will have to be dynamic, will have to be adaptable. The months uh, ahead will not be business as usual. We know this and we will be working even more than ever to help you share best practice so that we can all emerge stronger. We all know the importance uh, of winning and losing. We know that there are lessons from both sides. This is exactly what uh, I propose for us to work together to achieve our common goal of uh, a better world through sport and, of course, true clean energy. In this respect, I would like to thank uh, Sport Network for hosting us here in this TV studio. And I would like to mention one joint initiative with uh, SAFE or SAFE named Rome E, in which uh, Rome will become electric for two days, so the eternal city, full electric for two days, during which it will be possible to participate in conferences, learn more about uh, sustainability, experience smart mobility through a series of uh, concrete examples. My friends, I thank you for your time. I thank you for having attended this uh, workshop which has now come to a close. On behalf of uh, all of us, stay healthy, stay active, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. But allow me to thank uh, particularly our participant to the postgraduate program of SAFE, to the SAFE team, to our distinguished guests, Nico Rosberg, Jenson Button, Lucas Di Grassi, Alejandro Agag, Francesco Venturini, Rodi Basso, and certainly to all our partners and institutions that supported us to organize this uh, wonderful event. Thank you very much to all of you and looking forward to see you very soon.